Well, good morning, y'all. I'm excited to be here with you this morning. I hope you guys had a good week. Um, if I'm being honest, I had a pretty good week. All, all my weeks start the same. Uh, Monday afternoons at about four o'clock, our student resident, Thomas, and I, we lead a crew house of sixth grade boys. And uh, all crew houses are different. If you guys know a little bit about crew, everyone kind of has a different vibe to it and different things that they look forward to every week. So some crew houses, they eat dinner together every week. Some houses play games together every week before the lesson starts. This specific crew house that meets on Wednesday afternoons uh, of sixth grade boys, the thing they look forward to every week is handball. Uh, How many of you guys know what handball is? Just curious. I thought it was made up. So good to know that you guys know. I'm glad to know. If you don't know what handball is, it's basically imagine if you took like rugby and football and like hockey and they all kind of had a baby. Uh, That's what handball is. Basically, you have a ball and you're trying to score it in your opponent's goal and you're trying to stop them from scoring in your goal. Uh, And guys, I'm not lying when I tell you it's the most aggressive thing that I witness every week. It is crazy. It's not even close. Like these sixth grade kids, 12 year old, are like form tackling each other. They're like grabbing each other and slinging them to the ground to get this ball. Uh, Thomas and I, we don't, we don't watch just to watch. We watch to referee because we have to call neck tackles to stop them from doing that. Like, it's a whole thing. Totally unrelated. Your kids are very safe at PCBC students. Just, <laughs> that's what we have waivers for. Um, but it, this past Monday... Uh, got a little, a little too much, a little too aggressive. We had a couple kids get pushed in the back and fall over, some tackles that were not cool. Uh, some emotions got high. And so we had to have a little bit of a come to Jesus meeting this week with these kids. And so when we split the group and, and went to lesson, I just sat them down and I said, hey guys, just curious. Like I had this lesson I'm about to teach on my mind. So I was trying to get them there. I was like, guys, when a kid tackles you and it's, it's a bad tackle or like they shove you in the back and you fall down, how should you respond? And this kid, his hand shoots up. And I was like, oh no. And he goes, well, he said, when you get pushed down, he said, you take a minute, you take a breath and you get up, you dust yourself off and you keep going. And I was like, that's pretty good. (laughs) And then he goes, but then, (laughs) when you get the ball, he goes, you find that person and you look at them and you run straight at them. You drop the shoulder and he goes, and you run through them. He's like, you take them down. And I was like, yikes, that's about what I expected. <laughs> that's about, that's what you did. So fair. And as much as, you know, that's a wild thing to hear come out of a 12-year-old boy's mouth. Um, there's a part of me that when I heard that, I thought, you know what? I can't, I don't condone that. I can't condone that. But I, I understand. I get that. I get the desire that when we're wronged to want to retaliate. Because isn't that what we all do? Think about when you're in traffic and somebody cuts you off, you know, what do you do? You, you let them know that you know what they did. <laughs> you know, whether you're riding their bumper or maybe you come around and cut them off, maybe you just give them a special little signal that lets them know that you know what they did and that it was not cool. It's thumbs down, that's what I'm talking about. Thumbs down in a car is hilarious, by the way. If you've never given somebody a thumbs down, it's awesome. You should try it out. <laughs> but we might do that to retaliate. You know, if, if you're at work and somebody you work with makes your life infinitely harder, what do you do? You let everybody else that you work with know exactly how hard that person's making your life. We even do this in our relationships with each other. You know, if you have a disagreement with a friend or a spouse or a parent, kids in the room, you might, you know, emotionally pull back. You might relationally distance yourself from them. Maybe even give them the silent treatment. It's that subtle way of saying, hey, you hurt me, and so I'm gonna hurt you back. An eye for an eye, right? It's the way that this world operates. It's almost like there's this natural chain of evil action and an evil reaction that characterizes these human relationships. Retaliation, eye for an eye, that's the water that we swim in. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus jumps right into the middle of that pool. So we've been in this series called The Good Life where we've been talking about the Sermon on the Mount. We've heard Jesus talk to us about a few things, right? He's talked about being salt and light in the world. He's talked about how we navigate anger, how we navigate lust. And today we're gonna look at what he has to say about retaliation. So if you wanna go ahead and turn there with me, it's Matthew 5, 38 through 42. And Jesus is gonna answer this question for us. He's gonna answer the question, how do you get back at somebody as a citizen in the kingdom of God? How do you get back at somebody? In Matthew 5, 38, Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. 
But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. So Jesus lays this out just like he has in a lot of the previous sections in the Sermon on the Mount. He starts with what the crowd would know from the Jewish law. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And this is a quote. It's from Exodus 21, and it's in the section about the Jewish legal laws. The gist of this is that it's a law of reciprocal justice, that the punishment has to fit the crime, that there should be a just penalty for every evil action that there is. An example of this would be like if somebody uh, hurt, beat somebody else up or hurt somebody else and that person wasn't able to work, that the person who caused the harm would have to pay the wages that that person would have earned when they couldn't work. It's everything from that all the way to the other end of the spectrum, which is, hey, if you kill somebody, you pay for that murder with your life. It's the life for a life. So it's this idea of, of payment in the legal setting. And there were similar laws uh, in other nations at the time. If you put on your high school world history hat, you might remember Babylonian Empire, Hammurabi's Code. I don't know if that rings a bell for anybody, but if it was the first coded law that was handwritten down. And it had something in here that was really similar to an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But this law in Exodus that was given to the people of God was a little bit different for a couple of reasons. One, it made sure that the punishment fit the crime on both ends. So it made sure there was just payment for an evil action so that the punishment wasn't too light. But it also made sure that a punishment wasn't too harsh on the other end of the spectrum, that the punishment really did fit the crime. The other thing, uh, the, the other way this differed from Hammurabi's code was that in Hammurabi's code, the punishment for a crime was largely determined by the crime and who you committed the crime against. So you could commit a crime, the same crime, against a man and a woman and a slave. And your punishment for each of those things would be different depending on the status of the person that you committed that crime against. In God's law, in the Mosaic law, all people were protected the same way. It didn't matter who you committed the crime against. There was a just penalty for it. And you may have noticed this eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, it sounds very judicial, sounds very legal, and that's because it is. Every time you see this phrase, eye for an eye, in the Old Testament, the phrase is used in the context of a case being judged at the legal level. An eye for an eye, it was this principle that was meant to guide judges and meant to guide lawgivers to make sure a punishment was, was good and right. But what began to happen is that people took this, this law, an eye for an eye, and they began to see it as grounds for personal vengeance. So instead of letting the legal system kind of deal out justice like it was meant to and like it was supposed to, they began to take this justice into their own hands. They said, I can make this work. I'll take the responsibility of justice and I'll deal, deal it out. And this law that was supposed to stop the flow of personal vengeance, it ended up becoming the very reason people felt justified to take revenge. That was the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it seems that the Pharisees who were teaching this law had taken an eye for an eye and they doubled down on it. They'd actually take it even further. They extended it to everyday personal relationships. So they taught that seeking revenge in your personal relationships with one another was acceptable. So if somebody punched you, you could come back and punch them. If somebody insulted you and came against you, it was fair game to throw it back at them and insult them back. The religious leaders of Jesus' day had ignored the, the judicial basis for this law and they'd put vengeance back in the hands of the individual. My sixth grade boys from this week must have listened to this. <laughs> That's exactly what they did. <laughs> and this is the exact advice that we get from our world all the time, right? The behavior of seeking personal vengeance is encouraged everywhere. It's encouraged in the political sphere, right? It's not even really become about the issues anymore. It's just who can call somebody a better name? Who can be a better debater? We hear this in movies all the time about a guy seeking revenge for when he's been wronged. Like, we love that stuff. And we, of course, have all heard the modern masterpiece, masterpiece that's been written about this topic, Before He Cheats by Carrie Underwood. <laughs> of course. It, it's an amazing song. In the song, Carrie finds out that her boyfriend, husband, boyfriend, something, I don't know, was cheating on her, and he destroyed what she loved, which was their relationship. So what does she do? <laughs> she destroys what he loves, which is his car. So she takes the Louisville Slugger to the headlights, right? She carves her name in the paint. She keys the seats up, cuts the seats up. I asked Elliot to play that for a response song today. He said no. I, I was pretty disappointed. I thought it would have been good. 
But we all cheer, right, when Carrie slashes the tires. We're like, you slash those tires, Carrie. We love it. Because when we feel wronged, we want vengeance. We want justice, and we want to be the ones to give it. Everything inside of us, everything outside of us, says that it's appropriate for us to take matters into our own hands. And this is the world that Jesus steps into. And he says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. As followers of Jesus, how do we get back at somebody who's wronged us? We don't. Jesus lays out this situation in this passage where somebody gets slapped and instead of slapping back, he says to turn the other cheek. Scholars here in this passage, they say that Jesus is probably talking about a backhanded slap, which in the ancient world and in ours is insult as well as it is injury. So it's both. It's not just physical violence. It's, it's verbal, it's emotional, it's intentional insult as well as it is injury. And so to the people that Jesus was talking to and to us, there's all the reason in the world to be like, if somebody slaps me, I'm gonna fire back. Like I'm, I'm gonna slap back, I'm gonna hit back. But Jesus doesn't give us that option in this passage. Jesus completely rejects our desire for personal vengeance here. And instead, he offers us up a different way of operating. As Christians living in the kingdom of God, we give up the right to retaliate. We give up the right for revenge. And this is a radical shift in our perspective here because it goes against everything in us. You know, we're taught to not let people walk all over us. We're taught to teach people that they can't mess with us, that we will fire back if they do. But Jesus says this is not the way a citizen in the kingdom of God lives. He tells us not to trade insults and not to trade injustices, even if that means that by not retaliating, we're gonna see, receive more injustice and receive more insult. There's a phrase here that actually, it provides us with some really good context. And it's this phrase, do not resist the evil one. Figuring out what that's talking about, it helps us here. It's important. It's easy to think that the evil one that this is talking about, that it could be the devil, uh, that it could be even just an evil person who, who comes against you and who treats you poorly. But in the context of this law, the phrase do not resist the evil one actually means do not seek compensation in court. Don't seek compensation in court. So Jesus is saying here in this situation, when somebody slaps you, you'd have the option to take them to court and to receive some sort of payment to see them get punished. But he teaches that instead of taking them to court or handling it yourself, that you turn the other cheek, that you don't retaliate even when you could. This isn't just about denying your inner desire for revenge or for personal vengeance. It goes even further. Jesus says that even when you have legal reason to retaliate, that you don't, that you choose not to. And now, let's be honest, a lot of us, as we hear about retaliation, as we hear about revenge, in the back of our minds, there's this question coming up, and I know it is because it did for me as I was thinking about this, but like, when can we defend ourselves? When can we get back at people? Because surely there's moments where, where it's justified for us to retaliate. Because these situations that Jesus is laying out, when you're slapped, the situations he's gonna lay out here in the next couple of verses, they're not perceived injustice. They're, they're injustice. They're, they're wrong things that are happening to us. And so when something like this happens to us, when can we get back at people? There's no shame here because I thought it too. <laughs> but it dawned on me that this might be the wrong question to ask. I, I wonder if this is the question that Israel began to ask that got them to a point where they went a little crazy with an eye for an eye and they started taking personal revenge into their own hands. Jesus encourages us here to go against that part of us that wants vengeance because he knows what seeking vengeance on our own does to us that when we take revenge for ourselves, we're lowering other people, we're dehumanizing them, we're saying they don't have any dignity in the eyes of the Lord, we're elevating ourselves over them. And what we're really doing is we're trying to become God over this situation. 
When we take revenge into our own hands, we're worshiping something that's not God. We're worshiping ourselves. And the reason I think that we're so prone to soften this lesson from Jesus is because of that very reason that we're prone to worship us and we're prone to idolize us. Jesus encourages us to live like this, encourages us to deny that desire for vengeance because by asking us to not retaliate, by asking us to do this, he's actually striking at the very thing that we're trying to protect the most, which is us. We're trying to protect our pride. We're trying to protect our desire to be right. And Jesus is trying to get to the root of this issue here because he's actually more, he's after more than just right behavior. He's after our hearts. Jesus came to remove our hearts of stone to give us hearts of flesh and hearts of flesh that seek the good of everybody around them. He gives us hearts that seek to bless everybody around us, whether those people are our friends or our enemies. And if we live like this, we live kingdom lives where we seek to follow Jesus with everything in us, our lives are gonna begin to look really, really different. You know, your place of work will look different. Your home will begin to look different. Your family will begin to look different. But they're not gonna look different because of your behavior. They're gonna look different because you are a new creation that's been given a new heart. And that change happens, starts inwards, and it flows out of you. I do feel like when we're talking about retaliation here in this passage, it's important to mention that what Jesus is talking about here with an eye for an eye and, and di- not resisting the evil one and turning the other cheek, this is not about self-protection or protecting somebody else. Jesus isn't saying that we should just let evil kind of run rampant through our community. You know, if somebody's about to throw a punch at you, Jesus isn't saying, don't put your hands up, just take it. That's, that's not what he's getting after here. He's also not saying that if you see an injustice taking place, that you don't deal with it, that you don't protect the people in your lives or the people that you see. He's also not saying that if you are in an abuse situation, whether physically, emotionally, verbally, to stay there or to put yourself in one of those situations. This passage is not about that. It's not about protection. It's not even about public order and how our world works. This passage is what is just about revenge. It's just about retaliation. Jesus is teaching the disciples here not not to be determined on getting their own back when somebody wrongs them. That to be the victim of some sort of evil is wrong and you should defend yourself, but it doesn't give you the right to repay evil for evil. To be a victim does not let you repay evil for evil. There's gonna be moments where you should stand up for yourself. I mean, Jesus in John 18 at his trial, he does this, like he brings attention to the illegality of his trial. So it's not wrong for you to defend yourself. But in moments where you stand up for yourself or moments where you might have to put a boundary in place to protect yourself, those moments are never opportunities for revenge. Jesus goes on here to give us a few more examples of what this shift looks like for us. He continues on in verse 40 and 41. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. So, How do we get back at somebody in the kingdom of God? We help them. Jesus lays out these two more scenarios that tell us what getting back at somebody looks like. And it doesn't look like what we would expect or maybe want. Apparently it looks like helping people who would harm us. Jesus crafts this situation where somebody sues a disciple and takes their tunic. The tunic, it was like the piece of clothing that was closest to the skin. So this is literally like you are suing the shirt off of somebody's back. You are taking that from them. And Jesus says, instead of fighting, instead of retaliating, that you give them your cloak as well, the outer garment. And at first glance, it can seem like Jesus is just saying like, oh, you want this? Here, have this too. While you're at it, go for it. It's not totally it. (laughs) There's a little more historically at play here. Uh, The cloak was, if the tunic was the inner garment, the cloak was the outer garment, right? And the cloak was one, it was more expensive than the tunic was. But two, you legally, as a citizen of Israel, could not have your cloak taken from you. In America, we have certain inalienable rights. So we have the the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? There is nothing, as a citizen of of America, that's your God-given right that cannot be taken away from you, no matter what. As a citizen of Israel, 
one of your inalienable rights was your right to a cloak. You could not legally have your cloak stripped from you. So even the poorest of the poor, um, when they would steal, when they would do all kinds of stuff, they couldn't have their cloak taken as punishment. It was an inalienable right. So for Jesus to suggest that a disciple willingly give their cloak to somebody is incredibly significant. He says that they should gladly part with what they could legally keep. They, could, they should gladly part with what they legally had a right to keep. And Jesus calls us to have this same mind. We say this at PCBC all the time, but, but we're committed to radical holiness and radical hospitality, both here uh, in, on our campus and in all of our personal lives as we go to our, our places. So what would it look like to live this out today, to give somebody our cloak? Well, let's, let's keep the legal theme here for a second. So imagine somebody sues you for an amount of money and you feel as though it's unfair. It would be one thing to lawyer up and to go, hey, I'm gonna fight this because this is wrong and I'm not gonna let somebody take advantage of me like this. It would be a whole nother thing to pay the money that that person feels that they, you owe them and then on the back end of things, come around and say, hey, I would love to pay your legal fees. Crazy behavior, insane. When you've got somebody at work who, let's say you're coming up against for a promotion and it's between you and them, you know, they might be pulling the rug out from under you. They might be taking projects from you uh, and, and do, telling their boss that you're not the right fit, that they are. It would be one thing to do that same thing back to them, right? To tell everybody at work how you're better for, a better fit for this, how, how you're gonna do better work than they would. It's a whole nother thing to say, hey, can I help you with that project? And then give them the credit for it not take any for yourself. Kids in the room, students in the room, imagine if your brother and sister, brother or sister, gets you in trouble for something that you didn't do, which I'm sure never happens, never. What if instead of being angry, instead of fighting, instead of holding a grudge against that sibling, what if instead you went and did one of their chores for them? This, these, this is wild behavior, wild examples here. But now we're beginning to get to the root of what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, as disciples, we should be glad and willing to part with what we can legally keep, whether that's money or possessions or anger and frustration. I don't think anybody would be mad if you were angry or frustrated by having these situations come your way. But you should be willing to let those things go even when other people might look at you and go, yeah, of course you can hold on to that. Of course you can be bitter. The second example here is, is really similar. It says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. The possibility of a Roman soldier forcing a disciple or an Israelite to carry their stuff or give them directions somewhere was, was really real. It happened all the time. And Jesus says that even if you're compelled by force to do this, which they often were, that you can show freedom by going further than what's asked of you. It'd be easy for a disciple to just hate the situation they're in, right? To just be like, oh, fine, I'll take you there. And just mutter under their breath the whole time and call them names and get them to their destination and be like, see ya, I'm out. Like, that'd be, that'd be easy. I'm sure they did that all the time. It's a whole nother thing to say, hey, I could actually, I could take you further. Where are you going? Let me take you all the way. Jesus says the attitude of his disciples under these circumstances should not be spiteful, should not be vengeful, it should actually be helpful that you should be willing to go that second mile, willing to help. It's, it's the idea of asking your oppressor, hey, what else can I do for you? It's a wild thing to do. But I'll be honest, I think it may be easier for us to do that. I could see us getting here. Easier to convince ourselves that this is the right thing to do when somebody doesn't know Jesus. I think it's easy to be like, hey, I, you know, I wanna be salt and light in the world. I want you know, this person to have a good picture of who Jesus is. So sure, like I'll die to myself. I'll go the extra mile. I'll give the cloak. I'll do whatever. I think the hard part comes in when we have to go the second mile for the people that are closest to us in our lives. You know, when you just get home from work and you sit down and your spouse is like, hey, did you take out the trash or did you do those dishes? Or, you know, your kids ask you to drop them off at another practice or another friend's house. 
you know, or kids when your parents are like, hey, you have to do your homework before you go play that game or before you go to your friend's house. It's a lot harder to not be bitter at that. It's a lot harder to not begrudge that service. It's harder to say, hey, absolutely, I'll do that. And, you know, while I'm here, anything else? Is there any way, any other way I can help you? Usually we, we might do it, but with our body language, we'll be like, I'm gonna do the bare minimum of this. I'm gonna let you know that I'm not happy about it by the way I'm doing it. I'm gonna plop back down in my seat. <laughs> Jesus calls us not to be spiteful and not to be vengeful, but to be helpful. Whether the person that's asking us to do something is a brutal boss or a spouse whose tone is wrong or a kid who's frustrated or a Democrat or a Republican, you know? Who knows? It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter who's asking. We're called to be helpful, even when we don't have to be. Jesus takes this thought one more step further in the last verse of this passage. He finishes it up with verse 42. It says, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. How do we get back at people in the kingdom of God? We give to them. The negative command alone is never enough for us. Don't seek revenge isn't helpful on its own because our lives are a vacuum and something else is always gonna take that place. You've gotta replace the negative with the positive. And so for, for pride, you replace pride with humility. For lust, you replace it with self-control. And Jesus is saying here for vengeance, you replace it with charity. Here he changes the person that we're serving. This time it's not somebody who's wronged us. This time it's something, uh, somebody who's asking something of us. As disciples of Jesus, we don't just reject the desire for retaliation. We're also to work for the good of people and we're to work for the good of people who the world tells us that we can say no to. Jesus is saying that his people must be willing to get, willing and ready to give to anybody who asks, whether they're deserving or they're undeserving, that we should not reject anybody who wants to borrow from us. Now, there's probably some people in your mind right now. You know, maybe, I don't know, maybe your kids came to mind and you're like, dude, I can't say yes to my kids every time they ask me for something. Super fair. Or maybe you're thinking of homeless people. We live in Dallas. People struggle with homelessness all over our city. And you may be thinking, you know, one, I never carry cash. I, but I can't give them money every time. You know, even if I had cash to give, how can I know that they're gonna spend it in the right way? How can I know they're gonna do the right thing with it? Those are, those are fair thoughts. In this passage, to be fair, is probably hyperbole to some degree. You know, Jesus, I don't think he wants us to just have no money because we're constantly just throwing it out everywhere. And you know, if you said yes to your kids all the time, they would be horrible adults. So you, you need to say no to them sometimes. That's, that's a good thing for their development. This passage doesn't tell us how to behave in every given situation. It takes discernment to know when to give what. But what this does mean is that we're never to ignore or turn our back on somebody who asks something of us. This verb in here in this passage, turn away, it, it points to this like idea of refusal or ignoring that Jesus says shouldn't have any place in the life of a Christian. You know, we, we're not always gonna be in the position to give somebody exactly what they ask of us or exactly when they ask it. You may not have time to play with your kids right now. You may really not have cash, but that doesn't mean that we're supposed to reject people or ignore people. We've all done this, where we've been driving on the road and we've seen a homeless person on the side of the road and we've pulled up and we've pretended not to see them. We've all just thought, look forward. Once that light changes, I'll go right through and I'm not looking. What Jesus would call us to do in this moment is to discern what you can give that person. You know, it, it may be cash in that moment. It could be driving to a McDonald's down the corner and snagging a burger and swinging it back and just say, hey man, I didn't have anything, but, but I thought of you here. It could be just rolling down your window and saying, hey, I know light's about to turn, but how could I pray for you? And lifting them up to the Lord with them. It could be something as small as pulling up next to them and looking them in the eyes and smiling at them and giving them a moment of genuine human connection that they so rarely get. 
because people drive past them all the time and pretend that they're not there. I don't know what it is for you. It may be something small, but as a disciple of Jesus, we give what we can every time. We don't refuse, we don't ignore, we don't turn away. We give what we can in a moment, every time. And here's the truth. As much as we may want to change sitting in this room, as much as we may want to be different and and not live a life of reactivity, and as much as we might not want to seek vengeance, but we're fighting this thought that we always will anyway. That's the truth. That each of us, because of sin, that we're always going to fight that battle against ourselves to want to live differently, but to struggle against it. The good news is that Jesus doesn't encourage us to live this way as citizens in the kingdom for no reason. That he shows us that this is the way to live because it's exactly what he does for us. We'll end here, if you would. Would you turn with me to Isaiah 50, verse 6? Uh, Long before Jesus was here giving the Sermon on the Mount, his life, death, and resurrection was prophesied in the, uh, the book of Isaiah, through the prophet Isaiah. And look at what God says about the Messiah. It says, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting, but the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint and I know that I shall not be put to shame. Jesus asks us to turn the other cheek because it's exactly what he does for us. Every single person in this room, including me, has betrayed Jesus with our thoughts, with our words, with our actions, with how we respond to other people, with our hearts, we betray Jesus. And Jesus has every right to retaliate against us. He does. He could very easily and legally seek revenge on us because we would deserve it an eye for an eye. But instead of punishing us, he endures our punishment and then he takes more punishment on his behalf that he could have sought revenge, but instead he chose to help us and he gives, him, gives us the greatest gift that we could ever receive, which is himself and it's his grace. He saves us from himself for himself and by himself. And so when somebody comes against us and and we respond in anger or pride, we respond with an eye for an eye, we get to look at the one who turned the other cheek for us. We get to look at his life and he reminds us how we should live. But then when we look at his death, he reminds us that when we fail, that it's okay. And then we get to stand up We get to dust ourselves off. We get to take a breath and we get to do the next right thing. Get to figure out what that is. So what is the next right thing? For some of you in this room, you might not be struggling with revenge right now. Nobody may have popped up in your mind as we've been talking about this. And and that's good, I'm glad. Uh, But one day, they will. One day, someone will do something to you that will cause you to want to retaliate. And it could be worth thinking about now during this song, how are you going to respond in that? You might not know exactly what situation you're going to face, but if we can prepare with the word of God, it helps us to to respond better when we actually get into a situation like that. For some of you, as I've been talking, maybe somebody did come up in your mind. (laughs) Who knows? Maybe it's somebody that you have wanted to retaliate against or somebody you did retaliate against this week. A couple of weeks ago, Caleb, when he was teaching, he encouraged us at the end to send a text message to somebody to say, hey, we need to have a conversation and to reconcile with that person. I hope some of you guys did that a couple of weeks ago. Today, during this song, you might need to write out a text message to that person. You might need to lay out everything that they did and every way that you would want to retaliate. And then you need to delete it. Maybe you need to go home and you need to write a letter to somebody. I'm a handwriter. I don't know about you guys. Maybe you need to handwrite it and just get it all out and then crumple it up, tear it up, throw it away and let it go. 
process it, get it out, and then let it go. And then think of a way you can serve that person this week. We replace vengeance with charity. That's because that's what Jesus did for me, and that's what Jesus did for you. So if you guys would, would you bow your head with me? Let's wrap up. Jesus, we love you. God, we're grateful that you did not retaliate against us when you really could have, when legally we deserved it. God, help us to see your gospel, to be reminded of how good you are to us. And God, to let what you did for us influence our Monday, to let it influence how we treat our families, our spouses, our coworkers, our friends. God, we can only do this through the power of your spirit. But praise God, you've given it to us in abundance. So we thank you. We trust you. Be with us.